It's the Acting Income Podcast with Ben Houck, episode 35, Five Reasons Casting Directors Should Be Happy to See Workshops Go, with Ann Diacetus. It's the Acting Income Podcast with Ben Houck. Turn your passion into income, Ben will show you how. With all the resources that you need to make it as an actor in an expensive city. Welcome to the Acting Income Podcast. I'm Ben Houck, your host of the podcast on acting, making money, and the balance of it all. Thank you for downloading this episode. If you're new to the podcast and haven't subscribed yet, pull up iTunes or your favorite podcast app and click the subscribe button. You'll get episodes right as they come out. This is episode 35, titled, Five Reasons Casting Directors Should Be Happy to See Workshops Go, with Ann Diacetus. The show notes for this episode have all the important links referenced in today's show, which you can pull up right now at actingincome.com slash episode 35. And now, on with the show. On March 30th, 2016, The Hollywood Reporter published a piece by Gary Baum titled, New Hollywood Economy, Pay-for-Play Auditions for Actors Gain Dominance. It was a provocative look at the topic of casting director workshops, which, if you haven't encountered one are the types of situation where actors pay to meet or learn from a casting director or a casting associate. The topic of casting director workshops is controversial, mainly because casting directors are in a hiring position and actors are, more or less, the interviewees paying for an interview. But casting director workshops are also controversial because the education these casting director workshops offer can be arguable, especially given the cost. I've recently seen a five-minute slot with a casting person cost the actor $70, which is akin to paying $840 an hour. That said, a number of the organizations that run casting director workshops offer a disclaimer that reads that they're for, quote, educational purposes. One such company in New York City, where you'll see a number of casting directors offer seminars or workshops to actors, has in numerous places on its website this passage— The following disclaimer is provided specifically at the request of and in accordance with SAG-AFTRA. Seminars or classes are for educational purposes only and will not secure or provide opportunity for employment in the field or representation by an agent. So SAG-AFTRA is aware that there's a potential problem with these types of things, and Gary Baum's piece in The Hollywood Reporter drives it home, underscoring the actual legal issues with them in California. Baum exposed that California's Krikorian Talent Scam Prevention Act has hardly ever been enforced since it was enacted in 2010. But a day after the release of Baum's piece, some alleged fallout happened when a casting director for a popular television show who's been associated with casting director workshops lost his job. By April 15th, the Casting Society of America released a press release announcing the establishment of a workshop committee. So that is this episode's prologue. As for the meat of the episode, I've invited on actress and writer Anne Diacetus as a guest contributor. As you may recall, she was a guest back on episode 6, and she recently wrote a piece on Medium.com titled Five Reasons Casting Directors Should Be Happy to See Workshops Go. It was a piece that grabbed my attention, not just for its intelligence, coherence, and candor, but also for its unique approach to the problem of the existence of casting director workshops. So I asked if Anne would record her piece for the podcast. I'm grateful she obliged, and I hope you're grateful too. Here's Anne Diacetus. On April 15th, 2016, CSA, the Casting Society of America, issued a press release announcing a new committee to study the issue of casting director workshops. Specifically, the committee will, quote, seek to preserve and enhance the educational value of casting workshops taught by CSA casting directors and associates in various forums. The committee will also foster increased awareness and understanding among CSA members of the casting workshop guidelines created in collaboration with Los Angeles City Attorney's Office, close quote. It is within the new workshop committee's mission, let's be clear, to keep workshops alive lawful, but alive, even as it was formed in the face of sharply negative press from The Hollywood Reporter on the fundamental ethics of the workshop model and the ensuing obligatory slaughter of a sacrificial lamb. Scott David, casting director and workshop business owner, 
leaving or being forced to leave, industry rank and file aren't privy, his long-standing relationship with criminal minds. But maybe workshops should just go, with no one happier than CDs to see it happen. There's enough oxygen being taken up by the argument over whether workshops are pure, old-fashioned payola or smart, here-now actor marketing. Anyone hoping to hear about that here is invited to go elsewhere on the internet, literally anywhere else, to find it. Instead, let's focus on five good reasons casting directors should want to end workshops, no matter what they are. Number one, this is not the road to Oscar. The press release announcing CSA's new workshop committee includes a wonderful word, alchemic. It's true. A great casting process is mysterious and powerful and, above all, creative. There's vision involved in meeting an actor in one type of role and having the fullness of imagination to see their potential across stories and genres and scripts and characters. No other entity in the casting chain is as responsible for bringing that to the table. Bluntly, there is nothing about the current workshop process that develops this imagination. If anything, workshops stunt it, reducing CD's field of vision to content they know and to safe, easy fits versus the groundbreaking ones that get you hailed in documentaries years after you're dead. Sacrificing exposure to a fuller variety of performances, energies, and it factors comes at a creative cost that seems oddly underestimated. Sure, having just led a workshop might help winnow the field to cast a TV co-star role that's shooting tomorrow, but if your highest ambition is to become a better traffic cop, don't expect the Academy to recognize you for creative achievement. Number two, this is not the road to fair compensation for your work. The casting industry offers fewer and fewer secure, salaried, in-house positions at studios and networks. Life as an independent contractor requires sharper competitiveness based on price, and no one can deny the pinch. But it's past time to inject smarter business sense and standards. Hiding true costs from producers will only speed the race to the bottom. If a casting office cannot offer competitive pay to its own employees for casting, pay that covers the time and effort to find, meet, screen, and audition talent, the office is operating at a loss, and the business model will not prove sustainable. As arguments go, the slippery slope is usually a weak one, as it assumes no one involved has common sense. But with workshop profits now underpinning the livelihoods of CDs and staff, it seems past time to hit the brakes. CDs should heed the same warning actors hear from their cheerleading career coaches. No one else will value you if you don't value you. CDs don't need to supplement their income with workshops. They need to stop lowballing their contribution. Before, like Scott David, they would be forced to give up casting a popular network show to safeguard their workshop career. Number three, Hollywood already has enough of a diversity problem. What actors pay for workshops is its own issue, especially in light of the industry's widely lamented lack of diversity. As more and more production expenses get pushed down to the actor, the one party that doesn't actually have the job yet, the point of entry into the field becomes more and more expensive. That's not great for anyone, but do we really need to revisit the statistics to know which demographics get hit the hardest? The same industry that needs actors available on a dime, tied down by only the flimsiest and least lucrative of day jobs, now demands costly or multi-look headshots, professional-grade video and voiceover self-tape capabilities, and increasingly, the readiness to provide wardrobe for every type they could conceivably play. Never mind the encouragements to, quote, create your own work, i.e., find the additional resources and skills to self-fund as a filmmaker. In the context of these trends, Paid workshops displacing free generals and CDs attending showcases is devastating. Disparate impact is real. Casting hardly controls every obstacle to diversity, but CDs should raise their hands to disown this one. Number four, everything that is accomplished with workshops can be accomplished without them. Workshops' most passionate advocates cite their educational benefits— Inexperienced actors learn what to expect in the audition room, along with the preferences of various offices regarding communication, self-submissions, etc. CDs and talent can get to know each other and develop a rapport outside the pressure cooker of an actual casting scenario. Insights into the industry prepare actors to achieve greater success in their careers. 
The audition process itself is remarkably consistent across casting offices, something along the lines of be timely, be prepared, be friendly, slate, read, maybe take an adjustment, give thanks. But educational altruism will always be welcome. Many insights and preferences can be shared on a CD's website. Actors devour blogs and videos. Training programs and acting studios would kill to have more CDs visit to prepare their serious students for realities of the professional world. Of course, there's nothing like spending one-on-one -on -one time with great talent that you discover. Try seeing plays, catching film festivals, going to stand-up nights, attending improv shows, watching YouTube, and inviting talent that intrigues you in for a general. Want to keep seeing an actor and helping them grow? Keep calling them in. Offer that second take. Number five. The legacy and future of the casting director is at stake. In his incisive book on acting, The Actor and the Target, UK director Declan Donnellan challenges actors to split the stakes in order to understand them. Anyone struggling to grasp the urgency of their situation needs to consider not only what they want and how wonderful it would be to get it, but also what they fear and how terrible it would be to see that fear realized. It's the taut tension between hope and fear that motivates action. The stakes here are serious. If CDs sacrifice creative vision for expediency, participate in the devaluation of what they do, contribute to Hollywood's ever more chafing resistance to diversity, and withhold the simple acts of mentorship that every other professional doles out freely to junior workers in their midst, they undermine the case for their own dignity and existence. If the possibility of casting disappearing doesn't motivate change, what can? We need casting that is, yes, alchemical, unexpected, delightful, boundary-shattering. Let no one forget Marion Doherty's advocacy for Danny Glover to join Mel Gibson in Lethal Weapon in a genius pairing that defined a franchise. As covered in the HBO documentary Casting By, the breakdown didn't specify that Glover's role should be played by an African-American. Doherty's imagination saw not race, but relationship, brilliantly. To survive, casting as a craft must be safeguarded. It can reclaim its place as a creative art form, worthy of real compensation and hopefully one day, the highest awards. Or, CDs can continue to dilute their specialization for short-term gains, teaching the very producers they need to survive to see their role as administrative, cheap, replaceable, versus visionary. The profits from workshops could never be worth this cost. Is change unsettling? Yes. Many seem to believe that workshops are so deeply embedded in industry practices, eliminating them at this point is impossible. But let's not allow a failure of imagination, of all things, to kill casting. The profession is worth more and deserves better. It's in the hands of CSA's workshop committee to determine casting's future. Here's hoping their vision is expansive, befitting the legacy of a craft that gave us Doherty among so many others. The past, exactly as it was, won't be prologue. But by eliminating workshops before they do any more harm, PR-based or otherwise, and advancing a conversation about what comes next, CSA has the power to choose a more positive fate for its members. Anne Diacetis is an actress, singer, and writer based in New York. Her website is annediacetis.com. You can access her website, the originalmedium.com article, as well as the book she references and other items referenced in the episode at actingincome.com slash episode 35. Thanks for listening. This episode was sponsored by The Call Sheet Cheat Sheet from Stand In Central. To download a copy of The Call Sheet Cheat Sheet and to decipher all the codes in the call sheet the next time you work as a screen actor, visit standincentral.com slash cheat sheet. That's standincentral.com slash cheat sheet. The show notes for this episode are available at actingincome.com slash episode 35, where you can also leave a comment on this episode. You can also find Acting Income on Twitter and Facebook. Have a story idea? Shoot me an email at actingincome.com slash pitch. And be sure to click the subscribe button in your favorite podcast app to get new episodes of the podcast. I'm Ben Houck. See you next time. And for more information, as always, check out actingincome.com. 